state. The bottom line is the reports of treatment that are coming out of that jail are reprehensible. They are not American. These scientists may be complicit in one of the greatest crimes against humanity. But I think it raises a lot of questions about whether the money is going to be funneled ultimately into the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese military. You got to pick a side. And General Milley picked one. And it wasn't the red, white, and blue. Hello, folks. This is Rick Manning, President of Americans for Limited Government. I see my callers aren't right. The um, wanted to uh, get with you because we've got a lot of talk on this debt ceiling, but what we aren't talking about is actually what the government's spending the money on. And so I thought it was a good time to just kind of give you some basic numbers. Uh, so when people are talking about the debt ceiling and uh, there's a battle over what we can do to lower the debt, lower the national debt, or at least not raise the national debt as high as it is, as it's been raising, cut the deficit. Um, let's get some baseline numbers. Right now, the deficit in 2022 is about $1.3 trillion. I'm sorry, I'm, the, yeah, the deficit about $1.3 trillion. Our country spent 6.2, a little over $6.2 trillion. Our country brought in $4.9 trillion. That's how total revenues. So, that's how you get to 1.3, 1.2, 1.3 $1 trillion dollar deficit. But let's actually look at what that what that means, what that what those numbers actually are. I'm going to give you some comparisons. In 2020, 2019, before the pandemic, we had revenues of 3.46 trillion dollars. 3.46 trillion dollars. We had two. We had 4.9 trillion in 2022, a almost $1.5 trillion increase in the amount of revenues collected by the federal government in that three-year period. We had, for expenditures, 4.4, almost $4.5 trillion in expenditures. So when you had, and it was, so you end up, you actually end up with a trillion, less than a trillion dollar deficit there. So about four point four four trillion dollars worth of um, expenditures. That's on all expenditure categories. So our expenditures have gone up from four point four point four trillion to six point two trillion, an increase of one point eight trillion dollars. So you can see that the problem isn't that we haven't been getting enough revenues. We've increased revenues by 1.5 trillion. We've increased spending by 1.8 trillion. That's the problem. It's on the spending side that the problem exists. It's not that Amer Americans aren't paying enough taxes. It's not that corporations aren't paying enough taxes. It's that America's spending too much money. It's just that simple. So where are some of the places where we're looking at spending going on and where, where are we seeing real spending uh, increases. A lot of the numbers are hard to hard to kind of grapple with because so much of it is infused with COVID spending. And so it's hard to kind of see what the normalized spending was. Um, what it appears is though, though, is that I'll give you one simple example. Anybody remember this summer when Joe Biden said, I'm going to, I'm going to um, just arbitrarily um, limit, lift the burden on student students who have or people who have student loans by arbitrarily saying you're gonna get a ten or twenty thousand uh, dollars decrease in those student loans and oh by the way if you and we're also gonna begin to if you meet certain categories over 10 years haven't paid your student loans and you're in a nonprofit for those 10 years uh, providing a uh, allowing people then to say, hey, I've, I've met my obligation. It's a program that was that was created under the original student uh, student loan changes or was created actually back in the Bush administration. It was expanded during the Obamacare takeover of the student loan program. Um, but so, so legitimately under the law, people could say, hey, I want my, my the rest of my student loans discharged. And a lot of people took advantage of that. Um, what's more, if you had 10, if you had paid in, if you had, uh, if you didn't have, let's say hypothetically, um, you only had $5,000 worth of student loans left and you qualified for $10,000 um, deduction in your student loans, 
the federal government sent you $5,000 because you overpaid your student loans, according to their logic. So you end up with about $420 billion of excess of spending on student loans. That's a one-time expenditure. So automatically, the budget deficit should go down by $420 billion if the Congress doesn't allow Joe Biden to arbitrarily give away, you know, stop student loan uh, spending. Um, just give away, say, hey, we're, we're just waving our magic wand and saying this debt doesn't exist anymore. You lose about, because of the pausing on the, on the uh, student loans, the fact that kids, people still aren't paying them even after, you know, three years after COVID, um, people aren't paying their student loans. That's a, that's cost the treasury about $20 billion and lack of uh, principal and interest that they collect. So you, you deal with all this and you end up with, <clears throat> if you start having student loans repaid and you start having, and you don't have another just flat out giveaway, that's $420 billion right there out of a $1.35 trillion budget deficit. Just by doing that and making sure those things didn't occur and restarting the student loan payment program, you end up with a budget deficit cut to under a trillion dollars. So that's a reasonable starting point, a reasonable starting point. What else is, is reasonable? Well, what we know is that because you know, when we spent in 2019, $3.463 trillion, I'm sorry, we collected it. We spent $4.446 trillion in 2019. You could go and you could say, listen, we're going to say, we're going to just arbitrarily say, we're going to, we're going to add a trillion dollars to that and say 4.4 or 5.4. And in doing so, you would effectively recognize that the cost of mandatories, the cost of Social Security has gone up, more people are in the program. The cost of Medicare has gone up, more people are in the program. Um, and so there's a, and so you have some additional costs in the, the mandatories. And so with, with that, you end up with, uh, and that would pretty much take up the trillion dollar increase uh, to cover the costs of mandatories. And at that point, you'd be sitting there saying, okay, well, let's argue about how to spend the, this money. Um, and what are we going to do? Well, then you, you just say, this is, the, this is the amount of money we're willing to spend. That's where Congress should start on the debt ceiling. Is they shouldn't be looking at, they should start talking about how much money are we willing to spend? And then, and recognizing that $4.9 trillion of, revenues last year, it'll probably go up some because of inflation. So let's say it goes up to 5.2, just hypothetically. So you end up with 5.2 revenues as you should plan around with. So how do you, and you've got 5.6, let's say you say you want 5.7 trillion. You want to, you want a $500 billion deficit. You want to cut the deficit 1.3 to 500 billion in one year. All you have to, you know, so you take a look at that and you say, okay, well, what are we going to do? Well, at that point, you set up, you, you basically have an agreement along with the debt ceiling of what your spending target is. How much are you willing to spend in the next fiscal year? And you go from there. And that will take you to, will allow you to create an environment where you can rationally budget. And so rather than talking, and we all want to talk about, you know, balancing the budget, but we're not going to balance the budget in one year. OK, we might be able to do it in 10. And that is based on uh, you have to have continued increases in revenues and the revenue increase has been pretty extraordinary um, without raising taxes, which hurts the economy. You have to have a um, and, you know, so just inflation level increases in revenues, because that's kind of the, how it works. You'll end up with that being part of the part of the equation. Um, that's how you get the, that's how you get to 5.2 next year, five point, whatever it is, 5.5 the following year. So how do you get on the other side? Well, what the Congress did in 2011, is it is something called the budget control act. And they said in 2011, 
we're not spending any more than what we spent last year. That's all we're spending. And they held that for three years. And when they did that, what you saw was the spending side of the equation went, it, it just, I'll just give you the numbers. In 2008, it was 2.9 to almost 3 trillion. In 2009, remember this is a housing crisis that just hits, um, the, it's 3.5. 2010 is 3.45. 2011 is 3.6. The Budget Control Act goes in effect at that point. The next year is 3.5. The following year, 2013, is 3.45. 2014 is 3.5. And then they lifted the Budget Control Act, also in a sequester, and it went immediately to 3.7, 3.85, 3.9. In 2017, 4.1. So in a period of five years after lifting the sequester, you, you put you basically increased spending by about $600 billion and which was, you know, a significant percentage increase so, recognizing that since you lift, lift the sequester in 2014, when it was 3.5 trillion, your spending in, your spending in 2022 was 6.2 trillion. And that is with most of the COVID, the COVID spending is kind of washed through the system. There's still co some of that COVID spending there, but most of that spending is washed through the system. This is spending that's been increased based upon the inflation, inflation increases in the cost of government, inflation increases in the cost of Social Security, mandatory spending, um, and flat out increases that the Biden administration, along with the Pelosi and Schumer uh, cohorts in Congress, um, increase the, the baseline budget for virtually every agency. And so, and they did so with, with agreement of Republicans who were um, trying to make certain that they that defense spending went up. And so you ended up with this uh, equilibrium that occurred where um, everything went up, but it went up far higher than any kind of rate of inflation. So that's where we, that's where we are, $6.2 trillion dollars in spending. The reason I, I would say the way to get yourself actually into the game is not just to say we're going to we're going to cut that we're going to keep the spending at its current level because its current level is way inflated. It's dramatically inflated. And so instead, you need to take a look and say how do we get the current how do we get the spending not at its current level, but at a level that was reasonable in terms of in terms of a growth of spending based on inflation like, because you have to get something that the Democrats will vote for. And at the very least, you have to get something that 218 Republicans in the House will vote for. Actually, you need 214. You need something that again, as a majority of Republicans will vote for, 214 Republicans will vote for, um, assuming they don't vote against it, um, because the Democrats have 213. So how do you get there? You're not going to, unfortunately, I don't think you're going to be able to get if you just went for a sequester and said we're going to hold it at 6.2 trillion dollars you the there would be howling in the streets of course but the howling wouldn't be different than if you said we're only going to sequester but we're going to roll it back by half a trillion dollars to five point you know 5.7 and say okay we're going to roll it back half a trillion 5.7 is how much we're going to spend in 2022 in 2023 that would be a reasonable thing to do because you still have higher than previous, higher than pre-pandemic spending on defense and the entirety of the social welfare system, but you'd have a you'd have a placeholder where it would hold that number steady, and by holding that number steady for a few years, it allows the revenues to catch up. And, and that's not by raising taxes. That's just the natural flow of things. Um, over time, revenues go up because inflation and other stuff. So it's a, and that's why this is a, you know, it's a balancing act on both sides of the equation. The, the chance of the Democrats agreeing to cutting spending or even sequestering the, the current amount, which is an astronomical number, is challenging. And, but the reality is, we just showed you how you could drop the how you could drop the 6.2 to 5.8 simply by ending 
not allowing for any more Biden wave of the magic wand and we're going to spend $400 billion on waiving, uh, waiving student loan benefits, student loan uh, payments. That's a, that gives you 5.8. So if you, so you need 300, that's a $300 billion drop uh, from 5.8 to 5.5. If you get to 5.5, you're running next year in 2023, you're gonna be running us well under a trillion dollar deficit. You'll be running a 600, 700 trillion dollar, de billion dollar deficit. And you'll be on a pathway to actually creating creating a budget, at least a pathway to balance. Is it easy? Will there be some things that'll get cut that people like? Yes, there will be some things that are cut that people like. But the fact is, every single dollar that's spent by the federal government has a constituency, and what you're going to find is that one of the biggest risers in our costs is our Pay, debt payments, our payments on the debt. And that's going up for a simple reason. In 2022, our average interest rate on our debt, pay, our interest payments on the debt was 1.6%, according to the Secretary of Treasury. So, and right now, the you know, 10 year Treasury bills are going for over 3%. So, if you just have a 1% increase, on interest payments on the debt. And it's re we'll be rolling over or creating about, combined rolling over debt and creating uh, new debt that's about $8 trillion. Um, that's bonds and treasuries that 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 kind of come to, they, they come to term and you still, you roll them over and you, re, you, the, you just recreate that debt. Um, it's reasonable to expect that that's going to go up by by one percent, the average interest rate, given where interest rates are. So if you say it's just going to go up by one percent, just hypothetically, nine trillion dollars at one percent is a ninety billion dollar increase in spending on uh, on debt. That's the debt that we we that we sell to the public. That's what that would be ninety billion dollars. So right there. You have a an expenditure that is significant, you know, $90 billion more spent. That's on the mandatory side. But it tells you the priority. The priority by saying that the interest payments on the debt are must be paid, and that's what we're gonna hear during this debt ceiling debate. What they're telling you is the debt we owe to the banking community around the world, to those who hold our treasuries is more significant than any dollar that we spend on anything else. It's more significant than how much we, what we spend on defense. It's more significant than what we spend on social security. It's more, it's more significant than the dollars we spend on um, enforcing various federal laws and federal law enforcement on trying to, I guess we don't try to keep the border under control anymore. So maybe that's not a good example, but that's the key. Simply the vice we find ourselves in is that simply by holding steady because of the massive debt we have, we are going to see ourselves having the interest payments going up by 90, $100 billion, depending on high, how high interest payments go. And remember, it's not, it would be about 90 billion for 1% increase in our average payments. It's two. It's 100. It'll be 150 to 180 thousand, or 180 billion. So you, so you see the the vice we're in. We are benefiting right now on those interest payments by paying very, very low interest rates on them, 1.6 percent. Now those interest rates aren't available. The 1.6 percent isn't available. So we end up in that vice where we're looking at an automatic increase of our spending by more than 100, by 90 billion dollars. What that means is very simply, is that we're gonna have the equivalent of, just from the interest rate increase, the equivalent of two Department of Labor's. And what we spend on the Department of Labor, we're spending about 51 billion on the Department of Labor right now. Um, that's up, by the way, from about 35 billion in 2019. So there's some cuts, there's some cuts that can be made there, trust me. But there's a, so you look at 
you look at the increase and you say, wait a second, if you've got $50 billion at the Department of Labor, you got $90 billion of just interest payment, increased interest payments alone. You know, that's a, you know, that's a lot of change. That's a lot of money. I know when Joe Biden waves a magic wand and says, I'm going to spend $400 billion and get, and have people not have to pay their, pay their student loans. It seems like, oh, you know, people lose track, you know, million, billion, trillion, you know, it's, it's just zeros. But those zeros are a lot of zeros. And it's a, uh, and so just understand that uh, a, the audacity of waving a wand and saying, I'm spending $400 billion um, to satisfy a constituency. When your entire, at the time, your entire discretionary budget was about 1.7, 1.6 trillion. You spent about tw- you spent about 25% of what the government spent on all the other discretionary programs combined. And I, I guess in the in the funny money world of Joe Biden, you can do that, but in the real world, it has real consequences. The $400 billion of increase in the budget deficit has, an, it has a consequence. It has a consequence of, uh, of having to spend an extra you know, 20, probably $20 billion in interest payments, not just this year, but every year forward until we pay it off. And that, that next last time you looked, we have not had our actual national debt go down in a year. Um, I think since 1946, but I could be wrong. It could be 57. Point being, we talk about balancing the budget. We talk about lowering the national debt. We have to just get so we're, our national debt is not growing faster than our GDP. Okay, we need to get so our national debt, we've got to cut our... We got to cut the amount we're growing our national debt, and then with the hope of being able to turn the turn the tables and actually cut the national debt um, and pay it down a little bit. But right now, right now, simple. We're going to have a fight over it. This debt ceiling fight is a fight over the future of our country. It's going to pit the Democrats who are going to say we have to, we can't default on our debt no matter what, no matter what. This is. This is absurd. We can't do this. You're playing dangerous, risky games. And those like uh, like me who think the dangerous, risky game is continued going on the way we're going. It's unsustainable. It's a disaster. And it's not right for my generation to saddle the Gen Z generation with a debt that's going to force them to make horrific decisions about what they're going to cut. Because you know who they're, what they're going to cut for all you old, older people out there? They're going to say, you know what? Social Security costs too much. And, you know, they created the debt. So we're going we're gonna to fix that. And so you're just going to see all sorts of interesting political dynamics going on if we don't fix this now. And there's some who believe we can't get, we're over the edge, that we're not going to be able to fix it. I, for one, when I look at it, I say it's, it's in the fixable category. And the reason it's in a fixable category is because I know just three years ago, just three years ago, the entire the entire expenditures, the United States government was 4.46, 4.47, a trillion dollars. Three years later, our income is five is four point nine trillion dollars. If we had had a sequestration and didn't spend any more money, now we had COVID as in room and all that stuff. Okay, but this hypothetically, if we'd been able to just have keep the spending at a flat rate from twenty nineteen to today, we'd have a five hundred billion dollar budget surplus assuming the revenues were the same. That's a pretty, that's pretty bold. That's pretty bold at 1.3 trillion. I'm sorry. Um, That's pretty amazing. That's a pretty big number. So what are we going to do about it? Are we going to have the guts to sit there and suck it up for a couple of years and not spend, not continue spending at a astronomical level? Seems to me that you can set a number at 5.7, 5.5 to 5.7 trillion of how much you're willing to spend on defense, Social Security, Medicare, um, Department of Labor, you know, 
unemployment insurance, all that stuff. You can set it at 5.5, 5.7 trillion and very little pain, with very little pain and put us in a pathway. If you held that number for two to three years, put us on a pathway to balance in very short order. Now that's simplistic. People are on the Capitol Hill. Oh, this causes real pain. Bottom line is we spent, the Congress authorizes $60 billion, $100 billion for this. They spent $100 billion in Ukraine that we didn't have. If we just stopped giving $100 billion to Ukraine every 14 seconds, we would, you know, that would be a major plus. So you've got a, in terms of our budget, but this concept in Congress is that is, there's this bottomless well of money that they can continually dip into. And the reason the debt ceiling debate is important is because it reminds them it's not a bottomless debt well of money. It's a, it's a well of money that the American people are promising that they're going to pay to the debt to the creditors who own that debt. And at some point, the American people are going to say, I'm not paying it. That's that's the battle. We've got to fix this. And we can fix it now. And so I would encourage everybody to get a hold of your Congress, get a hold of your senator, and tell them to you know, stop the spending, stop the spending. Because if they just stop the spending, any additional spending and block Biden from doing $400 billion expenditures with a wave of wand, which I don't know how it's constitutionally valid, but um, if you stop him from doing that, you effectively are going to end up being a pathway to, you're going to cut it below by 400 billion without even trying, I don't do anything. That's, that would be the, that's the responsible course. And that's the least that they should expect to do in this debate. I'm going to take some questions. Um, hopefully some people ask questions. Yeah, Florida girl, that's, I didn't vote for that action. Yeah, you know what? Not many of us did. It's a, uh, and I, you know, one of the things that I was told, I won't say by who, but in the Trump administration, when I was making an argument for cutting spending um, during the Trump administration, this was back when the spending was at uh, 3.6, uh, I'm sorry, three point, about 3.9, 4.1 tr trillion. And I said, we got to stop this. What are we doing? And the answer that somebody relatively high up in the Trump administration gave me was, there's no public demand for cutting spending. You know, if people aren't telling us that they want spending cut, then we're going to not going to do it. And so ultimately, that's what we have to do. We have to tell our members of Congress, stop the nonsense, stop the spending. Let's at least let's at least cap it at five point eight trillion, and let's cap it there for three years. And if we cap it there in three years we'll have the budget deficit at least under control. We'll be, in, we'll be in shooting distance of being able to balance it with relatively easy measures, comparatively easy measures. Um, you don't dig yourself out of a hole all in one day. But the fact that $400 billion of the hole was arbitrarily spent by Joe Biden um, and the fact that they've increased the spending on, on the, on the uh, uh, domestic side uh, on all the agencies far beyond what the what any inflation rate increase would be tells you there's a lot of money sloshing around that can be that now we can just say we're not giving you any more enforce the belt tightening that has to occur in order for this country to remain solvent and actually become solvent so let's see what we got um stop and pork spending would help yep uh, it would, and the challenge on the pork spending is, is you know, when you have a dip, but uh, when you have a um, expenditure and out outlays of six point two trillion dollars, it turns out a very very small amount of it's pork spending. Very small amount of it's like in uh, doing you know giving grants and, and monies to foreign countries and stuff like that. It's relatively small amount of money. 
but yes, that's a, a low hanging fruit that um, that ending the pork spending, Republicans in the House refusing, can refuse to allow uh, the Senate to dictate that there's going to be earmarks. They could wipe out, they could basically say, we're not voting for any Senate earmarks on any appropriations bill. In fact, it's our hope that by having individual appropriations bills up in the House, we will be able to do, to right, re, really go and do a surgical cut in the, in the spending on the individual departments. So we're actually cutting fat and we're creating and we're cr cutting waste and we're cutting excess dollars that just flowed in there because Biden wanted to grow the government over the last two years. That's, you know, Pelosi and Schumer wanted to grow the government over the last four years. Now, Donald Trump's, you know, not, he's not without blame. I mean, the budget deficit went up dramatically under Trump. Um, and it was going up before COVID. But the truth is, it went up really big during COVID. And we haven't, and Joe Biden will say, I cut the budget deficit in half. When in fact, all that happens is special spending went away, and his and he didn't really cut it in half. He it was he was we had a, a boom in uh, revenues that he had very little to do with, and we ended up with quite honestly a, a an opportunity because of those boom in revenues where we could have brought the budget deficit into real into hearing kind of right once again a rifle shot. Um, over the last couple of years, and we just didn't do it. Bottom line is we wasted a tremendous opportunity when your when your revenues go up in three years by $1.5 trillion, $1.4 whatever is, uh, trillion dollars. That's a massive amount of money. That's like a 30%, that's like 30% more than what's being spent. That's a, that's a real opportunity. And what we chose to do is we chose to increase spending across the board by a higher amount. It was insane. It was bad choices. It were choices made by the Biden administration and choices made by the by the Pelosi Schumer Congress that got us into that because they didn't take advantage of the basic opportunity that the increased revenues provided. And by failing to do that, what they did was they further they buried us and we got no we got no benefit from it in terms of a fiscal standpoint. So now that the Republicans have a slenderly a slender margin in the House. This is their opportunity to say, wait a second. We're not going to say go back and just spend what we spent in 2019. Although they could. If they did, we'd end up with a surplus next year. They don't have to say that. They can say, we're going to, we are going to aggressively right now stop the spending and we're going to set a number as a number lower than what we spent last year. And like I say, you can talk, you can take 500 billion off and not, and not really miss it. Um, given that 420 billion of it was giveaways out of the department of education. So with that, that's kind of where, what we've got. Let's see here. Um, did the get his 20%? Um, you know, that's a lot of money. If you got 10% on the, uh, if you got VIG on the increasing spending, man, um, I think uh, I think Hunter might not have to do work for the Chinese and the Chinese and the Ukrainians. Um, people do their checking accounts better than our corporate. Well, you know, Roseanne, that's true, and the reason is because if you don't do your checking account, if you end up trying to pay credit card one credit card with another credit card with another credit card, you go to jail, and as long as we're not, we reelect the same people, we're going to get what we get. So that's what I'm, I'm just going to stop right there. And uh, I wanted to provide you with some of these numbers because nobody's talking about the increase in revenues that have occurred over the last three years, the increase in spending that's occurred in terms of real spending, not COVID spending, and the opportunity that this provides to actually uh, really cut fat, really defined fat out of the government new stuff that they're doing that doesn't make sense and old stuff they're doing that's obsolete. And the best way to do that is to give the departments less money and tell them, figure it out. And that's what we have to do. And I think if we do that, we will find ourselves at least on a pathway to fiscal sanity. And it will be, be because we're having a fight over this debt limit. So make sure that we have to win that fight 
And the way we're going to win that fight is if you people, if everybody out there gets in touch with your congressman, your two senators, and urge them to stand firm and let's balance this budget. Thank you very much for paying attention. And I will be catching up with you um, tomorrow with another exciting uh, talk about whatever the heck we're going to talk about. With that, have a great day.